if you'll loan us 30 minutes, you can trust we've got a guest that you can bank on. Who is he? You'll meet him coming up next on Carolina People. Good morning. Welcome to Carolina People. This morning we're at 1550 Oak Street, the Myrtle Beach branch of South Carolina Bank and Trust. We're focused on community banking and we're visiting with the regional president and this week's host of South Carolina Bank and Trust, Tommy Bouchette. Th thank you for having me, Greg. Good morning, Tommy. How exciting. Yeah. A lot going on. Of course, this new branch. You all moved in. It looks like the sign says May 3rd. That's correct. That's correct. We were real excited to be able to acquire this facility and uh, open up last May. It's been it good for us. It's so gorgeous. Far. It is amazing. Thank Yesterday, you. we were here filming with Charles Miles talking about mm -hmm. planning funerals. It's right. fascinating just checking out the facility. It seems to go on and on. That. Mm -hmm. The teller uh, back there just seems so far away from mm -hmm. uh, from the front desk. I mean, it's a great facility. Yeah, we're very proud of it, and we've had a good response. So it's been a good uh, good move for us. I bet. How long has South Carolina Bank and Trust been here in the area? What's, what's a little well, bit behind the Sa bank there? South Carolina Bank and Trust um, was originally First National Orangeburg out of Orangeburg, South Carolina. The institution is about 60 years old. Mm -hmm. But about five years ago, a decision was made to become a statewide bank and uh, moved our corporate headquarters to Columbia. And as you uh, would be aware, uh, Sunbank, which is a bank that uh, a group of local business people, with myself included, founded in 2001, uh, sold to South Carolina Bank and Trust, and that's how they got into the market. I stayed on as the regional president. Right. So of we have an office in Georgetown. Um, our home office is in Myrtle, uh, Myrtle's Inlet, and of course now Myrtle Beach. Just Myrtle Beach, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot going on, and of course to see some of the folks that were here in the office yesterday, seeing. <laughs> the city executive, Eric Keyes, That's and correct. some other folks here in the office, they were really excited about the future with SCBT. It's a great company, and I'm proud to work for them. Really. Absolutely. Tommy, you know, we think so oftentimes, and obviously later in the week, Randy Wallace will be with us talking about real estate. Harry Pavlak will be with us on Friday mm -hmm. talking about Save Our Cats. And, of course, those men involved oftentimes with banking and obviously the real estate industry. A lot has to happen sure. with banking. But when we think about banks, just a little bit about so viewers would understand how exactly, uh, I know it seems a very basic question, but how do banks work? Well, you know, Greg, it's really kind of a simple business. We, we essentially ask people to bring money to us, and we, we hold those funds in safekeeping, and we give them interest on their money, or we provide a service for them in, in the way of um, an operating checking account so they can uh, facilitate money from one uh, place to another. In return, we lend money out, and it's very much akin to um, you know buying something at a wholesale price and then retailing it. Uh, somebody comes in for a car loan, we retail a loan. So we take those dollars that come in through the front door and we lend them out uh, you know, on the side door right. and we make a spread. And in our business, you know, a net margin is, is very small. We don't have very much room. Um, a net margin might be 35 to 4% a lot of times on our loan portfolio. So you can't afford to take too much risk because you have one bad loan, it tears that net margin up. But, but it's all about buying money and then turning around and selling it for the most part. And really monitoring risk closely. You know, one of the things now that's happening more so than ever before with what's going on in our economy, particularly as it relates to mortgages and, and housing uh, bubble, uh, burst, or, or, or whatever you want to call it, um, this whole idea of managing risk, that's really what most bankers do is every day they try to figure out, you know, if I invest, you know, a million dollars in this loan facility, um, what is the risk associated with it, and can I get paid a fair premium uh, to lend that money out and absorb some of the risk associated with it? Right. Okay. Real quick about yourself, Tom. Mm -hmm. You've been in the banking business a good while. I saw over, the reading about years. you almost 20 years. Yep, yep, yep. Um, prior to that, I was uh, in the retail business, and I'm a native of this area, so uh, been kind of involved in the real estate industry prior to getting in banking, so um, real familiar with our area, uh, I think that's important as well. Yes, yes. So when you say from the area, you actually grew up very close uh, by. Just outside Georgetown, a little community uh, outside Andrews, actually. Right, right. Absolutely. So you do know this area. I think I saw you came over here in the mid-90s. Mm -hmm. um, I was with yeah, I mean, Wachovia Bank. Myrtle Beach. Yeah, yeah. transferred uh, Wachovia Bank uh, to Myrtle Beach in 1995. Right. So you have been following the banking. You've probably seen some of the highs. Uh, 
and some of the lows over the last 20 some years. Yeah, yeah. Um, it goes back even farther than that. I used to be an organization called a Federal Land Bank, and you know, agribusiness went through a terrible cycle in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, being a young man just starting in banking um, and, and lending primarily with the land bank, you, I saw real estate uh, drop in value 30, 40, 50 percent over wow. a two or three year period. Mm. And, um, you know, th people forget very quickly how things are, and cycles come and go. And, you know, if, as far as you want to go back in history, there's been real estate cycles where people have, you know, made a lot of money in real estate and then they've had bust and then they come back up again. So we're going through a cycle now, and, and we'll get through it, but um, um, it is an interesting time. Recently, we've heard a lot about this phrase subprime mm -hmm. time. Share with you is exactly what that's referring to sure. when they talk about subprime loans. Well, you know, a lot of folks uh, <laughs> kind of uh, relate that to prime rate, the prime interest rate, which is right. totally different. Okay, but, good. But the prime interest rate is just the um, the best rate that the largest banks in the country lend to their best borrowers. So they use that as an index. Now, in mortgages, residential mortgages, when you're talking about subprime, you're talking about a loan that is less than um, highest quality. In other words, it's a mortgage that may have some uh, imperfections or some weaknesses in it. For so example, it has nothing to do with the prime rate. No, nothing to do with the prime good. rate. That's it's, good it's, to know. I bet a lot uh, of folks get that confused. What, what it is, it's, it's less than a, um, a prime quality asset. Right. Right. Now, sometimes those imperfections are very minor, has very little impact on the mortgage, mm -hmm. but there's something about that particular mortgage um, loan that it's a little weaker than what it normally would be. You know, it may be a case of where the guy has a or lady has a very high loan uh, or debt to income ratio, and uh, because of that, they can charge a little higher rate. So back two or three, four years ago, when real estate was going so strong, and um, you know, it just seemed like there was no end to um, the increase in the value of real estate, investor pools that buys these mortgages on what we call the secondary market would go in and if they could get a little higher yield on, on what they were buying, they would take a little more risk. Mm -hmm. Well, as long as real estate values was going up and the market was great, um, then they looked like heroes, these, these fund managers that was buying that kind of uh, mortgage paper. Now, unfortunately, when, we, when that bubble burst, or, or at least when the correction happened, it created an environment then where uh, people started saying, you know what, I'm upside down on my mortgage, I owe more than what it's worth, I'm just going to give it back to the lender. Mm. And as a result of that, um, all these uh, loans that had those weaknesses was the first one to start to default. Right, right. So that's where the subprime idea comes mm -hmm. in. You know, the conception or, or misconception is that, you know, banks hold a lot of subprime paper. Well, some of your larger, you know, like a city, um, or, or uh, you know, maybe even a, a Bear Stearns, a Goldman Sachs, those type of uh, financial institutions, they would buy you know billions of dollars of mortgage paper, and they right. sell them in securities or sell them off as securities. Well, what happens at that point is they get stuck whenever people quit buying them, so they have to hold them in their books, and that's whenever you first started seeing the the breakdown, if you will, in subprime paper. So we're really seeing those issues not necessarily with banks here locally, no. but with very large right. multinational banks, maybe even ones based in New York or otherwise. Correct, because what happens, the average bank in, in our community or in our state um, or across the country for that matter, the average bank does not hold 30-year fixed rate mortgages. Mm -hmm. They're originated to be sold into investment pools as securities. Mm -hmm. So when you come into the bank, you know, your bank may originate that 30-year mortgage fixed rate, but it's sold off pretty much right at closing or Is shortly. Is that right? Yeah. Almost always locally. Yeah. So locally. even though our relationship may be with Tommy Bouchette or with another right. banker up and down uh, the, the Strand or in the PD or southeastern North Carolina, that you or whomever is not going to have much control of that loan later yeah, on? That's or? right, because it's a 30-year fix, and we disclose that up front. You know, right. If you came in, we would say, now, now you know, Greg, this is a 30-year fixed rate product. In order to get you a 5 and 3 quarter or 6% 30-year fixed rate mortgage, right. uh, we'll have to sell this off into what we call the secondary market. So right. you're told that up front. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, that mortgage gets sold off, and, and some of the larger banks will continue to service those loans. They have what's called a servicing agreement with the right. investor pools. And then what they'll do is you may even get statements and everything from whatever bank. Right. But in reality, that bank doesn't hold that paper. Okay. So for banks our size, and, and you know we're about $2.6 billion in assets today. Right. That's big. Pretty good size. And um, we don't hold you know, any of that subprime paper. Mm -hmm. when, when we were doing that, when the market um, had a product um, available for it, 
uh, we would originate it for those investor pools and then sell it off. So mm -hmm. we really don't have that kind of subprime exposure, and most banks don't, you know, most right. smaller banks anyway. That's fascinating, Tommy. That's something that a lot of people may not know. I'm glad you right. said, as you say, you highlight that up front. Uh -huh. You make sure and let people know. What about local real estate conditions? Of course, again, Randy Wallace will be with us uh -huh. later this week on Thursday to talk about some local real estate market trends, and obviously this is a non-commercial show, but at the same time, it's interesting just to think about yeah. local real estate conditions, let's say here along the Grand Strand. Well, you know, as a, as a lender um, in this marketplace, um, you have to do real estate lending. You have to do construction and uh, you know, acquisition and development type loans because that is our industry. I mean, we, you know, we're not in Greenville where we have you know, very much manufacturing sector. So as a result of that, you know, we're involved in it every day. We, we finance a lot of construction projects, a lot of development loans, and uh, the, no question about it, there's been a tremendous slowdown. Um, but, you know, we've been real fortunate. We've got good operators. We've got guys that's been in this business for a long time, and they've seen the cycles, and they could kind of see this one coming, and they right. put back a little cash, and they, they cut back. So overall, I think most developers are still in pretty good shape. However, I, I will tell you that we've seen some deterioration in values. Um, you know, we're not where we were a year or two ago. And, you know, by definition, a correction, which is what most of the expert, experts would tell you, that's what we're experiencing is a correction in the real estate, just like the, you know, stock market goes through these correction periods. Um, that's to be expected. Right. So, but the good news is, you know, we still have these baby boomers coming down and uh, they're retiring and they're going to find, you know, a place. And um, if we can ever see some improvement in the northeastern market, now I right. really think um, that we'll be in great shape again. But There's some good buy opportunities there. Wonderful buying opportunities for people. Right, yeah. surely. And there'll be people continuing to come to the Myrtle Beach area. That's right. O'Ree yeah. County is going to continue to grow. Obviously, the opportunity of South, uh, uh, the U.S. Interstate 73. Uh, I-73 terminating impact. in the Myrtle Beach area is going to be a tremendous coup. Well, I, I, again, I would say that, you know, in the market we're in, all things being equal, we are probably better positioned to weather this storm than a lot of markets. You know, South Carolina as a state, um, the last report I saw, our foreclosure rate was uh, just slightly above 2%. 2%, yeah, right. Which is not, you know, not great news, but yeah. compared to other states, I mean, we, I mean, a lot of states are even double digits, you know. Wow. Uh, the folks in Florida, for example, are really having a tough time. Right. You know, Michigan is terrible. I mean, 12 percent. So mm -hmm. we, you know, we're we're going to stand the storm a lot better than the average um, market might be. Speaking of standing the storm, a lot of folks think, should I be with banks, for instance? Should I? What's the difference of keeping my money at home? What What is a bank going to do for right. me instead of me shoving it under my mattress? Coming well, in early this morning to, to to be here with you, and thanks again for opening your uh, home here for us to uh, to be here this week. But wh wh why should I put my money in with a bank? You know, Greg, day in day out, I, I truly believe that a bank is the most safest place in the world you can put your money. Really? You know, of course, you got FDIC coverage. Now, the Federal Deposit Insurance uh, will only cover um, up to a hundred thousand dollars per account. Per so, account. So theoretically, you could come in and you know, have $100,000 in a CD and, you know, you and your child or you and your mother or whoever could have another account set up. So there's ways to get more than $100,000 in coverage. But but just having that protection, um, you know, you can't guarantee $100,000 protection at your mattress. Right, <laughs> so, right, 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 right. And, and the other thing, too, is, you know, banking today is so highly regulated. Now, mm -hmm. even with all the regulatory oversight we have, mm -hmm. that doesn't stop people from making mistakes or that right. doesn't stop... Um, you know, uh, market conditions from deteriorating to a point where um, banks run into problems. Right. But overall, it is a very rare occurrence indeed to have a bank fail. Why is it so heavily regulated, Tommy? Trust. I mean, trust. you know, um, if, if you're going to bring me your money, you've got to have a certain amount of trust in that institution. The government has to make sure that banks live up to this whole concept of trust mm -hmm. because without that, you know, the banking system would just not be a viable alternative. Right. And, and if you can imagine trying to be a business person or even a, a consumer and needing to go somewhere to borrow money so you can buy that house, um, there's got to be a stable, secure, and trust mechanism in place that allows for people to you know, go out and borrow money. And um, the banks provide that vehicle. Right. Was it that trust component originally, Tommy, that got you interested in the industry? What yeah. was it that actually... Um, uh, 
spurned your interest 20 some years ago? You know, living in a small town, um, I was doing a few real estate investments myself. I was dealing with a banker. Um, mm -hmm. Just loved the whole idea of banking and um, got to know, and you know, in a small town, particularly a long time ago, a, a banker was probably one of the most trusted people in that community. Yeah. And, and I would still like to think that for the most part, we are still that way. Right. And, and you know, when you use the term bankers, there's all kind of bankers. There's mortgage bankers and commercial lenders and, you know, mm -hmm. um, stock uh, brokers, which kind of fall under that category. But right. day in and day out, I, I just think that the average banker um, is required and the expectation for them is to be uh, one of the most trusted type of personalities you can ever deal with. We've had some bankers with us recently, highlighting Mary Jo Rogers with mm -hmm. South Atlantic Bank, yep. Wayne Gray with Tidelands Bank, some other folks highlighting some of the basics that folks have to go through. What are some of the things you look for, let's say on a commercial loan, Tommy, if I wanted to open a restaurant or mm -hmm. and maybe didn't have a lot of restaurant experience, what are some of the things, we got about 10 minutes, what are some of the things that you look at when you're looking at my, if I've filled out some forms or otherwise to try to get a loan, what are some of the things you're looking at specifically uh, on my loan application? Well, when you move from a consumer purpose loan, which is a little bit more process driven, you know, debt to income, credit score, loan to value, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, when you move into commercial lending, I, I like to say that every deal is a new deal. In other words, it's not process driven. You really have to underwrite, number one, management. Um, and character. Um, you know, if we're looking at a, making a commercial loan to someone, if we can't get past character, mm -hmm. um, you know, is this person trustworthy? Is this person someone that's got a legitimate um, plan? Are, are, they, are they forthright and honest in what they're telling us? If we can't get past that for whatever reason, nothing else matters. Um, we're just not going any far. Now, once you get past the character piece, you know, the next thing is cash flow. You know, there's two parts to um, mm -hmm. determining whether a loan is a good loan or not. Um, one of them, of course, is is the character and, you know, is there enough cash flow? But in addition to that, you know, sometimes people will want to pay, that they have the desire to pay, but they don't have the ability to pay. Mm -hmm. And those two things are totally separate. Um, in some cases, you know, we'll find someone that has a desire to pay but don't have the ability or vice versa. They have the ability to pay Right. But they don't have the desire to pay <laughs> for whatever reason. Yeah. Right. Yeah, whatever uh, that is. Uh, but if if that comes together, if they have the desire and, and the ability to pay, mm -hmm. and we try to determine ability, you know, character will tell you whether they have the desire to pay. Right. Um, cash flow, understanding where that money is coming from to service to debt. Because, you know, keep in mind, collateral value doesn't repay a loan. Mm. You know, there are asset-based lenders or what some people refer to in the industry as hard money lenders that will lend you money on nothing but the value of that underlying collateral. Right. And if you've got the money or don't have the money, it's immaterial because they're planning on liquidating that collateral. Uh, banks are not that way. Banks can't depend on collateral. Uh, we have to depend on you know the ability to repay us and the cash flow because at the end of the day, nothing else will repay a loan. Nothing mm -hmm. else but cash. Right. You've got to have cash to keep right. making those payments. Yeah. So we, we, we spend time on that. And then, of course, all the other things that you would normally think about. Is it a viable plan? Is it a good location? You know, is there experience uh, within mm -hmm. the management of that company? Mm -hmm. So you, you factor all those things in, and then you hopefully end up with a, a credit that, you know, works. And that's, that's virtually the same thing for all commercial lenders. They're sure. looking for the same things. Uh, should be. They should be looking for the same thing. And that would cover the gamut from a small community bank with one branch that's or right. one main location up to a large bank with thousands, tens of thousands right. of branches. And, and the bigger the organization gets, the uh, typically the harder or the more um, rigid those uh, underwriting requirements have to be because you can imagine if you had 5,000 loan officers across you know, 15 states, right. you've got to have pretty rigid controls or you have everybody you know, doing their own thing and, and you don't have that consistency that you need. Yes. Smaller banks can be a little bit more um, individually driven. Um, right. Um, and in a bank like ours, we're set up with regions. So in our region, um, you know, myself or, or someone that's in my position somewhere else in the company in another region have a lot of autonomy. I mean, sometimes the numbers don't work. Sometimes you can't quite get your hands around some of the peripheral issues. Right. But you know the person. You know, you, you know who they are. You know they're deeply rooted in this community. Mm -hmm. um, and you just have to take a little bit of faith out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, not every. I mean, there is no one size fits all to commercial lending. Right. Very good point. Very good point. So, community banks, for instance, or smaller 
uh, banks have that opportunity, as you say, to, to be a little more uh, focused more on the individual than, than just pure numbers. That's correct. That's very important. I mean, we've heard a lot about a credit crisis recently. Yeah. That's surely an issue that's facing a lot of folks. Are they, is, that, is that something that we need to be concerned about? Is, well, just what's the depth of the credit crisis? Is there really a credit crisis, or is it just um, a, a return to what would it be sound or just more sound, sound lending. lending practices? Well, primarily where the credit crisis is is in the mortgage industry. That up till you know a few months ago, you could go into um, a bank or mortgage broker's um, office and you could get a low doc loan or a, a, a no income verification loan mm. or you can get a hundred percent loan these were things that was unheard of you know uh, just a short time ago well as that real estate bubble started to swell um, over time uh, the terms or the underwriting became more and more liberal to a point where you know if you had a heartbeat just about you could have um, qualify for a mortgage. Mm. Well, a lot of people was taking advantage of that um, underwriting weakness to be able to go in and buy a house they couldn't afford in some cases, or in some cases they were purely speculating because mm. their neighbor or their friend had bought a house two years ago and it went up 20 percent and, and they were just trying to buy a house thinking it was going to continue to go up. Right. Well, now the credit crisis, if, if there is one, is only limited to people that don't qualify under normal traditional underwriting standards. I can tell you that if, that if you are a qualified borrower, there is no credit crisis at our institution. Right. Um, there is plenty of money. I mean, listen, we're looking every day to lend money because that's the only way um, we have to generate revenue. Right, to, lend to money. make money, yeah. yeah. So if you're, if you're a borrower with good credit and if you qualify for a mortgage um, and, you, and you perceive that a credit crisis, then call us. We'll be glad. <laughs> we'll right. take care of it. Right. Yeah. But, but the only credit crisis would be in those really um, – liberal type underwriting standards that cause this problem we're in right now. Mm. Well, so oftentimes I'm sure folks are thinking, particularly if they, what if they got a loan during the bubble? I mean, if they got a loan at the 100% or the no doc, mm -hmm. should they, uh, do they even want to bring that to anyone's attention or to it's, highlight that? As long as they're making their payments, it's right. totally immaterial. Okay. And, and you know, you, you're going to have cases where some folks are upside down their mortgage. You know, yeah. you, you've seen um, uh, price devaluation to some degree, and maybe they paid 400000 for the house, and today one just like it sold down the road for three sixty. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's their home, if they're living in it, they need to just keep on making a living, keep on servicing that mortgage, and, and, and not worry about what that day-to-day -day valuation might be because, you know, after all, it is your home, not, right. not a true investment like stock or some other type of investment would be. Mm -hmm. In an instance like that, just as you said, let's say the homeowner and they've got a very high rate or one of those rates that's going to jump up. If the, for instance, an appraisal wouldn't hold that four hundred thousand dollar valuation, if it's just worth three sixty, mm -hmm. would they be able to maintain? Oftentimes, or is it? Of course, it's person to person, but maintain that if they did one of those hundred percent or no doc well, loans, would they be able to maintain that position and still? Well, well whatever their original terms were when they right. went into that mortgage, they would keep that regardless of any valuation difference in the in, in the collateral or in the, okay. in the house. So the danger they have if they didn't get a 30-year fixed rate, and keep in mind, when all this was going on, a 30-year fixed rate was under 6% for the most right. part on average. Well, you know, maybe you got a five and a quarter by getting a five-year adjustable rate, or maybe you got a teaser rate for the first year at 3%, and then right. it was going to go up. Well, yeah. the only people that ever really appealed to was people that were speculating. The average homeowner, at least all the, in my experience has been, when they would come in and they could see that they could fix their rate for 30 years at under 6%, yeah. that's what they would do. But for people that were trying to flip property or people that was just really more investor focused or for someone maybe that thought you know, they could buy the house and, and afford this payment and now they can't, right. it took those adjustable rate mortgages. Those are the folks that could probably have some challenges because mm -hmm. those rates will continue to go. Right. Now, having said that, though, even today, five-year arms, um, you know, probably well in six percent. So, you know, you got is that right? Yeah. And a thirty-year fixed 30, 30 rate, thirty-year under six percent, is a great opportunity for folks oh, now. Yeah, absolutely. If they've got some credit worthiness, it's a good opportunity right. to get into a bank, whether it's SCBNT or down the street, right. Horry County State Bank, or all the plethora listen, of banks down here on the corner. Of listen, there's no shortage of banks. They'll be yeah. glad to help these folks. I well, that you. is exciting. There's some new banks coming to the market as well, Tommy, oh, yeah. with the addition of. South Atlantic mm -hmm. Bank, I That's believe, right. and Coastal Carolina National that's Bank, right. and Cooperative Bank. There's a lot of banks that's just coming a, onto the scene. What is it about Myrtle Beach that's so attractive? 
those baby boomers. You know, people. Baby boomers. Listen, everybody believes that, that the baby boomers that have been, um, you know, visiting our area for 20, 30, 40 years, um, they want to retire and they want to live in this area, and why not? So, okay, we're going through a cycle now, but this too will pass. And when it does, um, long term, we believe that there's going to be a ton of opportunities in the rural beach market. That's and, and that's just indicative of what uh, our market is, I think, to see all these banks, you know, flocking to, to Myrtle Beach. That's exciting for you and SCBT and so many others. Thanks so much for being with us this morning, Tommy. Thank you, Greg. Don't crush my hand oh, again at 7 a.m. My sorry Lord, they're doing it right here at SCBT. Yeah. Stay tuned to more Carolina people with, with regional president, Tommy Bouchette, coming up next. You heard him say it. Those are such simple words. Banking is all about trust. It's all about trust, whether you're banking at South Carolina Bank and Trust or you're banking down the street at one of the other amazing local regional or national or multinational banks there's a tremendous place to place your dollars whether it's moving them from underneath your mattress into a bank or moving them from one bank to another just recognize it's all about trust take the time to learn more about South Carolina Bank and Trust at scbtonline.com scbtonline.com or stop in to see a local banker or go to any area bank you'll learn more about trust with bankers just like Tommy Bouchette. Tommy, thanks so much for being with us this morning. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.